the regional codices and semantics. Examination of the data provided by Abu Amr al-Dani concerning the differences between the regional codices of Syria, Medina, Kufa, and Basra reveals that they form what is essentially a perfect stima or family tree showing the relationship between codices. This observation was initially made by the German Orientalist Theodor Noldecki. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right. It's N-O with two dots on top of the O, L-D-E-K-E and later updated and refined by the historian Michael Cook. Semantics analyzes variants of a text in order to determine whether the text was the parent from which another copy was made. In order to understand the argument, let's first provide some basic examples to illustrate the original concept underlying the application of semantics. Assume that we find three copies of a book which have small variations in the following sentence. Book one, there was a gray car outside the house. Book two, there was a gray cat outside the house. Number th book number three, there was a gray cat outside the house chasing a mouse. In this example, book two and three agree on a cat outside while book one says it was a car. We know that book three must have been copied from book two, but it would not have been copied from book one. To further elucidate the matter, consider the similarities and differences between the following squares. Imagining that each represents a codex, S for Syrian, M for Medinan, B for Basra, and K for Kufin. Figure one, squares with variants forming a stemma. Imagine that you were told that one of these squares was the original, and every time it was copied, a few squares were changed from blue to yellow, or from yellow to blue. How would you determine which squares are the original? Notice that the squares only differ with respect to the position of yellow squares the coordinates of which are identified by the row numbers and column letters. Notice furthermore that S has two isolated variants shared by none of the others, G1 and D7, and K has three isolated variants shared by none others, I3, I7, and A5, while M and B have no isolated variants. Every yellow square on M is also present in S, and every yellow square on B is also present in K, while B and K share no common yellow squares with S and M. In other words, S never agrees with B and K against M. B never agrees with S against M or M against K, and K never agrees with M or S against B. This is, in some loose sense, analogous to what Cook observes in the original codices. Syrian Mus'haf, 16 places where it is different from all the other three Mus'haf, and 13 places where it agrees with the Madani Mus'haf against the Basran and Kufan Mus'haf. It never agrees with the Basan and Kufan Mus'ahif against the Madani Mus'haf. Madani Mus'haf, no isolated readings, i.e. readings that are not found in any of the other Mus'ahif. It has only 13 places where it agrees with the Syrian Mus'haf against the Basran and Kufan Mus'ahif. Basran Mus'haf never agrees with the Syrian Mus'haf against the Madani Mus'haf. One isolated reading in chapter 23, verse 85 to 89 is present, which is not found in any other Mus'haf. Cook agrees with the narration describing this as a later addition after the time of Uthman since it doesn't fit the stemmas. Kufan Mus'haf, six isolated readings that are not found in any other Mus'haf, otherwise it always agrees with the Basran Mus'haf against the Madani and Syrian Mus'ahif. Based on these differences, Cook argues that we can reconstruct the relationship between the Mus'ahif, knowing that the Syrian Mus'haf is more closely related to the Madani Mus'haf than to the Basran and Kufan Mus'ahif, which means the Syrian Mus'haf was copied from the Madani Mus'haf or vice versa. Similarly, the Madani Mus'haf is more closely related to the Basran Mus'haf than it is to the Kufan Mus'haf because the Kufan Mus'haf has six places that are isolated readings. So therefore, the Basran Mus'haf is between the Madani Mus'haf and the Kufan Mus'haf. Based on this argument, Cook presents four possible stemmas. Possible stemmas according to Michael Cook. Let us consider the merit of Cook's argument from semantics. Does it provide convincing evidence that one codex must have been copied from another codex? The answer is affirmative, since otherwise the fact that they form a perfect stemma becomes a sheer coincidence or an elaborate ruse. Had the codices been written independently of one another and Uthman told the committee to put a certain specific variance in the Syrian codex, the certain specific variance in the Medinan codex, and so on, and for the Basran and Kufan codices, then one would expect each codex to have its own isolated variants, mufradat, or to share some variants with each other of the other codices. 
There would be some cases where the Basran and Syrian codices agree against the Medinan, or cases where the Kufan and Madinan agree against the Basran. Rather than forming a stemma, the picture would look something like this. However, where Cook errs in the matter is his claim that the existence of a stemma rules out the possibility of invention, i.e., the possibility that these variants are deliberately introduced into the codices. This is imprecise. The existence of a stemma rules out the possibility of synchronous invention, where codices are being written simultaneously and variants are being dispersed between them during the writing process. However, it does not exclude the possibility of sequential invention, where one codex is copied from another one at a time and during the copying process, the scribe is deliberately instructed to make few specific changes to the original at particular places in order to accommodate other readings. In the course of synchronous invention, there would be no generation of a stemma while the course of sequential invention. It is impossible for the copying process not to produce a stemma. Note that a detailed evaluation of the various hypothetical scenarios will be provided in the subsequent section, including a refutation of the allegation of scribal errors. The subject of semantics and the regional codices was recently revisited by Haytham Sidki, who extended the analysis to examine over 50 Quranic manuscripts for the very same regional variants reported in literary sources. Likewise, analytical studies of the regional variants in smaller subsequence of existing Quranic manuscripts have also been performed by Muhammad Mustafa al-Azami, Ala Bahidniya, and Muhammad Sa'id Metwali Ibrahim al-Rahman. Many of these manuscripts have been dated to the earliest period of Islamic history. The results of these recent studies are remarkable. The very same textual variants reported in the Islamic literary sources are found distributed in the manuscripts according to the very same patterns. The manuscript evidence thus confirms the historicity of the Uthmanic Codex and the accuracy of the traditional Islamic sources in documenting regional variants. For instance, the Codex Parisino Petropolitanus, uh, abbreviated to CPP, demonstrates agreement with the variants reported from the Syrian Codex. CPP dates to the first century Hijri, and was recovered from the mosque of Amr bin al-As in Fustat, Egypt. Today, most of the codex is located in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, a national library of France in Paris, aka Paris. The manuscript is written in Hejazi script. So this figure is showcasing the verse of chapter 3, verse 184, written according to the Syrian Uthmanic Codex, with Wabiz Zubair as opposed to Wa'az Zubair. This is also exactly how the word is recited according to the Qira'ah of the Syrian reader Ibn Amr. Image is from the National Library of France. The famous Mus'haf, known as Quran of Uthman in Tashkent, Uzbekistan, also known as the Samarkand Codex, demonstrates concordance with the regional variants of the codex that Uthman sent to Kufa. This manuscript dates to the late 2nd century Hijri, i.e. roughly one century after the Uthmanic project, it was previously located in St. Petersburg, Russia, and in 1905, a facsimile copy was produced by S. Pisarev. It is written in Kufic script. This is a picture of the Pisarev facsimile. This is a picture of the Pisarev facsimile from the Samarkand Codex, showcasing the verse from chapter 36, verse 35, written as Amilat instead of Amilatuhu. This is also exactly how the word is received by the Kufan reciters Hamza. Al Kisa'i Khalaf and Shoba's transmission of Asim. Image from Corpus Corcanicum. By similar analysis of regional variants, one may note, for instance, the Medinan regional variants in the famous Tokapi Quran located in the Tokapi Palace Museum in Istanbul, Turkey. The allegation of scribal errors. With respect to the allegation that the Uthmanic codices contained scribal errors, there are two separate issues that need to be addressed. Number one, the claim that variants between the regional codices are scribal errors, and two, the claim that certain narrations from the companions indicate that there are scribal errors. Typically in textual criticism, when textual variants are encountered in a manuscript tradition, the general assumption is that the original reading has to be corrupted. However, there are a number of clear reasons why the assumption cannot be lazily applied to the textual variants of the Osmanic regional codices. First, 
It ignores the existence of the Qira'at, the established of reading traditions. The historical evidence inarguably establishes that different ways of reciting the Qur'an preceded the existence of the Uthmanic Codex. If a textual variant could have existed in the reading traditions, then its inclusion in the Uthmanic Codex cannot be automatically attributed to scribal error. The codices were not produced exclusively through a copying process without any oral interference. We are informed in the literary sources that during the transcription process, one person could be designated to dictate and recite while the other person would transcribe. For instance, Uthman said, let Said dictate and Zaid transcribe. If the scribe was only reading a text in front of him, there would be no role for the reciter. On the other hand, if the reciter was the only one reading the text and the scribe was writing exclusively based on what he heard from the reciter, then we would not obtain the pattern of orthographic idiosyncrasies discussed earlier, which point to a single textual archetype from which other copies descend. The synchrony of oral transmission alongside textual transmission created a highly effective filtering mechanism whereby a textual variant could only be transmitted if it conformed to a pre-existing oral reading. Secondly, the maximum number of isolated variants is approximately 15 which is found in the Syrian Codex. Of these were assumed to be transcription errors during the process of copying the Medinian Codex. This quantity is astronomically smaller than expected, and the remaining codices have even fewer variants. By way of comparison, in the text of the four Gospels, roughly similar in length to the Quran, the Codex Sinaiticus and Codex uh, Vaticanus, I'm guessing because one Codex is from Sinai and the other is from Vatican, contain 3,036 textual variants, including entire omitted phrases and verses. If we ignore omissions of words, phrases, and verses in the Codex of Sinai, and pretend for a moment that it predominantly has single-letter textual variants like the Syrian Codex, then we still end up with the astoundingly discrepant rate one variant per 21 words in the Gospels and one variant per 5,100 words in the Quran. The only scientifically plausible account is to judge the underlying mechanism generating textual variants in either scenario to be categorically different. For the Codex of Sinai, the mechanism includes scribal errors, and for the Uthmanic Codices, it is the reading traditions. Furthermore, examining the variants of the Uthmanic Regional Codices demonstrates that the variants are not randomly distributed throughout the Codex. Of the 15 variants in the Syrian Codex, seven are located exclusively in Surat al-An'am and Surat al-A'raf. This requires us to assume extremely high fidelity copying throughout vast swatches of the Qur'an with sudden, inexplicable, sporadic lapses, including during the transcription phase as well as subsequent review and verification. Either way, it is far simpler to conclude that these were specific instances where oral readings influenced the inclusion of specific textual variants during the transcription process. This is particularly true if we accept evidence from the tradition concerning the deliberate inclusion of the alif in chapter 23, verse 87 and 23, verse 89, which confirms that the early Muslim community was concerned about such minutia with respect to the correspondence between reading traditions and manuscripts. As such, we should consider minute alterations similar to in chapter 23, verse 87 and chapter 23, verse 89 to be the result of scribes including existing oral readings rather than errors. In the narration concerning the process of writing the Uthmanic Codex, we are informed about one word in the entire Quran on which the committee differed. Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri reported, they differed on the occasion concerning whether to recite a tabut or a tabu. The Quraysh said a tabut while Zayd said a tabu. This disagreement was brought to Uthman, so he said, write it as a tabut, for it was revealed in the tongue of Quraysh. Interestingly, among the textual variants of the regional codices, we note that from chapter 5, verse 54, the Syrian and Medinan codices have the unassimilated Qur'ayshi form of the word yartadid, which matches uh, Surah Al-Baqarah verse 217, so chapter 2, 217, while the Kufid and Basra codices have the assimilated form as per the, the, the Mimi dialect yartadi. Given that these are precisely the types of dialectical variations for which the committee was responsible to seek Uthman's approval, it is more rational to presume the deliberate inclusion of a known variant from the reading tradition 
that the committee overlooked the same exact word twice, either during writing the Syrian and Medinan codices or during writing the Kufan and Basran codices in chapter 5, verse 54, but never in chapter 2, verse 217. Thirdly, the nature of the textual variants encountered in the regional codice strongly argues in favor of these variants representing pre-existing oral readings. Absent from the Uthmanic codices are any typical instances of transcription errors alike. And these are words I have never seen in my life. And so I'm going to pronounce them. They seem Latin. In other words, that literally they seem Latin. So parabolipsis, secondary to homeotelutin, haplograph haplography, or didography. <laughs> the last one, I don't know why it's making me laugh. Didography. Uh, I don't know what these words mean, but feel free to look it up in a dictionary. Um, again, parabolipsis is P-A-R-A-B-L-E-P-S-I-S. Uh, homeotelutin is H-O-M-O-E-O-T-E-L-E-U-T-O-N. And uh, haplography is H-A-P-L-O-G-R-A-P-H-Y. And dittography, D-I-T-T-O-G-R-A-P-H-Y. Feel free to look it up. Um, yeah. <laughs> Continuing. All of the textual variants of the regional codices result in syntactically and semantically viable readings. In cases where there is a perceptible impact on the meaning, both readings bring about mutually complementary and linguistically sound interpretations. What fortuitous circumstances would bring about the massively improbable coincidence of a scribal error adding or omitting a meme in one location where it is semantically appropriate to have both readings based on different preceding passages? Fourthly, the reception of the Uthmanic codices was overwhelmingly successful and quickly became the basis upon which all qira'at were recited and other musahif were transcribed. As previously mentioned, the early Muslim community was aware of these textual variants and indeed cataloged them extensively as evidenced by the numerous early works and narrations on the subject. By all accounts, the Prophet's companions and their succeeding generations had no qualms reciting the teaching and Qur'an according to these codices with regional variants. Not a single narration records hesitation over reciting a letter determined to be a textual variant. None of these sources declare those particular variants between the regional codices to be the result of scribal errors in Quranic manuscripts, even though they did discuss the concept of scribal errors extensively, as we shall observe in the next section. Abu Bakr al-Udufi is one of the early scholars to repudiate the notion that the regional variants could be the result of scribal errors. Al-Udufi writes, The understanding of occurrences of addition or subtraction in the Masahif is that they are written according to the reading of those companions sent to each of the provinces, and what indicates this is the Qurra. Famous reciters attribute their readings to the senior companion of their region. And these variants, in their addition or omission, were recited during the time of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. and were that not the case, they could not be written in some codices and omitted from others. And it is not possible to imagine that they could be errors from the scribe, for verily Allah has preserved it, i.e. the Qur'an. The proof of that is that when Ali began his reign as a caliph, he did not change anything from it, but rather endorsed the action of Uthman. And they used to dislike even dotting the Masahif out of fear of adding to it. So how could they add letters or variants and have such additions approved? al Udufi then gives examples illustrating the early Muslims' abundant caution in adding any markings of any kind, including chapter markings, verse markings, and consonantal diacritical markings. So, it is not possible with such caution that these letters could arise except via explicit proof or knowledge that they could not occur by the error of scribes. One may observe that Udufi mentions both the first and fourth points of consideration identified above. That is, he mentions the existence of established reading traditions with these regional variants, and that he mentions communities' reception of these variants, particularly the example of Ali bin Abi Talib. Moreover, he contrasts the reception of these regional variants of the early Muslim community's reticent attitude toward even the most trivial manipulations of the text. Fifthly, one may address the question of purpose. Why include only a small number of seemingly trivial variants? 
there are a number of historically plausible scenarios that would explain a small number of textual variants that we see. Not all these scenarios require that the matter had been discussed and deliberated upon by Uthman and the committee prior to the initiation of the compilation project. The stated goal of the project was to reduce the differing and conflict over readings taking place amongst Muslims by uniting upon one Musaf. It is plausible that during the transcription process, the participation of different members from the extended committee of 12 members would have influenced the decision about the inclusion of a minute number of variants in some codices as opposed to others, a decision which would have ultimately been reviewed and approved by Uthman prior to sending out the codices. One aspect of the extensive review and verification process of very minor changes is highlighted in the report of Hani al-Barbati. He reports, so I'm going to summarize the following statement. I was with Uthman when the committee was reviewing the Masaif, so he sent me to Obey bin Gab with the scapula of a sheep, upon which was written, and there's different Arabic uh, statements written. Um, so Obey asked for something with which to write, and he revised the spellings of the Arabic, such that he wrote it in a way where he removed one of the two lambs, and he also uh, added a ha. The above example of a single letter changes were carefully considered and discussed, and these particular examples do not show up as textual variants among the regional codices. However, in the above example, the role of Obey bin Gab is limited to correcting some spellings on specifically requested words. Given that the people of Syria were more familiar with the reading of Obey bin Gab, it is not unlikely that Uthman would ensure that the Syrian codex received additional participation from Obey bin Gab. Recall that scholars like al fuwi and al mahdawi suggested that the regional variants were intended to accommodate readings of a particular region. Recall also that some scholars suggest that the Uthmanic committee initially included only four core members before expanding to include a total of 12 members. This also makes sense of the differing narrations considering Sa'id bin Al-As dictating versus Ubay bin Gab dictating and Sa'id reviewing. The involvement of companions like Anas bin Malik and Ubay bin Gab in the Medinan Codex and particularly Ubay bin Kab in the Syrian Codex suggests a plausible scenario for the minor variations encountered in the regional codices. The sixth point, though, somewhat technical, appears to empirically exclude the possibility of attributing the regional variance to scribal error. It draws upon the previous discussion of semantics and combines it with a consideration related to the Mutashahabihat, passages of the Quran that resemble one another. Notice First, the several of the textual variants appear to recapitulate passages found elsewhere in the Quran. Thus, the Syrian and Medinian variants for chapter 5, verse 54, matches uh, chapter 2, verse 217. The Syrian, Medinian, and Basran variant for chapter 46, verse 15, matches chapter 29, verse 8. The Kufan and Basran, chapter 54, verse 24, matches chapter 60, verse 6. This predilection of textual variants of Mutashabihat verses appears to have been gone unnoticed in prior studies of these variants. Yet, it can be no accident that the Mutashabihat passages are so highly represented among the textual variants. What follows is an argument by way of reducitio ad absurdum. It's another Latin phrase, sounds like a Harry Potter spell, but continuing. Those who consider these to be scribal errors should have to concede that they are not instances of misreading the text being copied, but rather a case of memory interference known as assimilation of parallels, which would arise from the recollection of, similar, of a similar passage. But on that assumption, the error would dissolve the original difference between the two passages. Thus, if the Quran originally contained a passage that says A1 and another passage says A2, a memory-based error would result in two passages that say A1 or two passages that say A2. Overall, memory-based errors homogenize differences between Matashabihat passages, resulting in fewer and fewer differences. Projecting backwards, the direction of heterogeneity, I think that's how I say it, allows one to identify the original text. We may exclude those examples for which both regional variants match the other Quranic passages since it is not possible to identify directionality in such cases. Memory-based errors should accumulate as one descends from parent to child in the stemma. The direction of increasing homogeneity, homogeneousness, I guess, is the appropriate understanding, should also be the direction for transcription within the stemma. Yet, this leads to conflicting directions violating the stemma. See the diagram below. 
um, I'll be putting it on screen here, demonstrating that these regional variants cannot be attributed to error. So this figure, uh, the, presum the presumed rationality of copying from parent codex to descendant codex based on the variants arising through the process of assimilation of parallels, given that the inferred directions are mutually contradictory and that these contradict the relationships deduced from the semantics, it can be reasonably concluded that the regional variants were deliberately included to conform to an existing reading transmitted by, from the Prophet by a companion and thus do not represent errors. In other words, on the claim of scribal errors, either the existence of the stemma becomes a massive coincidence or the predilection of regional variants for Mutashai Bihat becomes a massive coincidence. Notice, of course, that the Quran contains multitudes of Mutashai Bihat which feature no variants in the regional codices, including some which are quite extensive. These would be the passages most vulnerable to assimilation of parallels, and yet they are free of textual variants. On the other hand, the Mutashahi Bihat, which feature textual variants, are comparatively much easier to sort out and generally the least confusing to Ahufat, those who have memorized the Quran. All of this lends further credence to the argument that these regional variants are deliberate inclusions of pre-existing reading traditions and nothing in the Uthmanic Codex is attributed to scribal error.